Hello, Bio 104 students. Today we'll have the first of two lectures that deal with animal diversity and evolution. So here are the points that we'll talk about in this lecture. And as always, I'll recapitulate these points at the end of the lecture. Okay, in looking at the great tree of life, remember we have the bacteria, we have the archaea, which are paraphyletic relative to eukaryotes. What's important about uh, this slide is to point out that by far, animals or the metazoa are the most species rich clade of the major eukaryotic lineages. So if we look at plants with about 400 to 500,000 species, all of the unicellular eukaryotic lineages total somewhere about 500,000 uh, to 1 million species. Fungi, somewhere about uh, one to two million species and animals somewhere between 10 to 100 million species. Now, these are the estimated total number of living species and in green are the number of known that, or scientifically described species. So this slide also shows that much of the known biodiversity that has been described and cataloged scientifically is just a fraction of the estimated total living biodiversity. Okay, now we can define animals as multicellular eukaryotes that eat other organisms in that they're heterotrophic, they're not making their own food, and they have internal digestion. Now, the phylogeny has coenoflagellates, which we'll talk about briefly, sister lineage to animals, and coenoflagellates plus animals are the sister lineage to fungi. Now, these groups uh, this phylogeny, as well as these groups, are strongly supported by molecular phy phylogenetics, but the monophyly of the animals, coenoflagellates, and fungi is also strongly supported by a very similar structure of the flagellum, if a flagellum is present in cells. Now, we talked about in uh, the fossil evidence for multicellular animal-like organisms at the end of the Precambrian. Remember we talked in the uh, previous lecture about the Ediacaran fauna. Now, what we find then by the middle part of the Cambrian is abundant uh, at fossil evidence for complex and derived animal lineages. So it seems that much of the diversity of the major lineages of living animals that we have on Earth today originated and diversified in a very short period of geologic time, stretching from about 540 million years to 520 million years ago. So in that fairly short narrow of time, we see the sudden appearance and explosion of the biodiversity that comprises the major phyla, the major lineages of animal diversity. Now, much of this evidence, but not all, but much of this evidence in the earliest aspects of this evidence comes from this remarkable formation in the British Rockies of Canada called the Burgess Shale. And the Burgess Shale is a Cambrian aged formation that uh, is found uh, in the Rockies of Alberta, Canada. And there are these different quarries that are bearing uh, the fossils of these amazing organisms. And the Burgess Shale was initially uh, really worked up in the early 1900s by a scientist working at the Smithsonian Institution, Charles Walcott. And in Walcott's notebooks, we could see uh, the, the initial discovery of what ends up being really bizarre lineages or bizarre organisms that are found in the Burgess Shale. In fact, this uh, uh, bizarre critter down here in the lower right hand is called hallucinogenia, in that is if one was hallucinating to see an animal with such bizarre morphology. Now, the Burgess Shale uh, fauna uh, had a renaissance of exploration discovery uh, starting uh, from the 1960s through the present day. And this is really well characterized in the very readable, but yet scientifically sound contribution by the famous evolutionary biologist, Stephen Jay Gould. The book is called Wonderful Life. 
and I strongly recommend that you engage with it. Anybody interested in evolutionary biology would uh, learn a lot from Wonderful Life, and anyone uh, who's practicing evolutionary biology can gain a lot of insight from the ideas that Stephen Jay Gould is proposing in this book. Now, Stephen Jay Gould, in one hand, in Wonderful Life, is providing a, histor a history of the science around the discovery and description of the Burgess Shale fauna. But also, uh, what Stephen Jay Gould is arguing in the uh, book Wonderful Life is there seems to be a random accidental pattern with regard to what lineages with major body plants that go extinct versus others that survive. So what we're looking at at the bottom diagram here is a abstract phylogeny where let's say in the x-axis, there's a measure of anatomical diversity. So lineages over here are much more morphologically disparate from lineages over here as they are to lineages that are close to them on the phylogeny. And then what we're looking at on the y-axis is time. So what Stephen Jay Gould is pointing out in Wonderful Life is that much of the anatomical, morphological, as well as the phylogenetic diversity of animals originated in this Cambrian period. But what Stephen Jay Gould also argues is that you don't have to invoke natural selection or adaptation to explain why some lineages make it to the present day and other lineages go extinct. What Stephen Jay Gould is arguing is that maybe much of the reason why some of these lineages go extinct, whereas other lineages survive and persist, is just accident. It's just contingency. It's just being at the wrong place at the wrong time with regard to extinction or being at the right place at the right time with regard to persistence and subsequent diversification. Now, some evolutionary biologists have argued that evolution is deterministic, so that if we go back in time and restart the, the radiation of animals at the Cambrian, uh, during the Cambrian period, that in the present day, we would still have the major groups of organism, uh, animal lineages that we see today. So arthropods, annelids, chordates, etc. Stephen Jay Gould argues the opposite. He says that evolution is, is um, is dependent much on the outcome of evolution is dependent much on accidents or contingencies. So in a sense, if we go back and replay the tape of life, we will not necessarily result with the same biodiversity that we see today. And this is a really important insight in, in uh, debate in evolutionary biology between a deterministic, that evolution is deterministic, that it will have a set of um, uh, determined and predicted outcomes versus evolution, in a sense, is responding to accidents or contingency. Now, we do know that many of the Burgess Shale organisms are phylogenetic related to living lineages. In particular, many of these groups that we find in the Burgess Shale, we call stem lineages. These are fossil lineages. These are lineages that are extinct that are resolving on a phylogenetic stem that's leading to a living group. So we see that many of these Burgess Shale lineages, when their morphology is coded and analyzed in a phylogenetic analysis, that they're phylogenetically, they're resolving on the stem leading to the arthropods. Now, fossil evidence exists for essentially all of the uh, modern clades of animals that date go back to the Cambrian. So again, this idea of this, this observation, the Cambrian being very, very important in terms of the origin and diversification of the major living animal lineage, lineages is borne out in the fossil record. Now, the phylogeny then tells us that all of these major animal lineages diversified prior to the Cambrian. So here we have a phylogeny of the major animal lineages. And the idea is that if these, all these animal lineages existed at the Cambrian, uh, 
then therefore these relationships that are inferred in the phylogeny, these diversification events must have happened prior to the lineages being preserved in the fossil record. So it's clear that while the Cambrian is a time period where we're seeing the presence of these major animal groups in the fossil record, the diversification of these lineages likely, very strongly likely, occurred prior to the Cambrian. And in fact, if we go, and we're going to talk about this in a couple of lectures, where if we estimate the divergence times of these lineages based on the amount of genomic divergence, that is thinking about a molecular clock, in that if we can calibrate the molecular clock, that is the mutation rate, uh, the number of substitutions per million years, we can then estimate the ages on a phylogeny. So here's a phylogeny of those animal groups. It's essentially this phylogeny, but now drawn to reflect evolutionary age. So here what we see are the major groups, these major animal lineages. Here's a geologic time scale. The bars show their presence in the fossil record. But the branches in the phylogeny are estimates as to their divergence times. And what we can see is that much of these divergence times existed prior, happened far, far uh, earlier than these lineages uh, being present in the, the fossil record. So if these lineages existed in the Precambrian, where we currently lack these fossils, what was going on? Why the sudden Cambrian explosion? And that remains an unanswered question. However, let me show you a really interesting study that was done uh, about eight years ago that's trying to attack this question by looking at arthropods. Let me get my talking head adjusted here. Okay, so here is a phylogeny of living arthropods. And the phylogeny is drawn to reflect the estimated age of the diversification events in the phylogeny, all right? So the outgroups are, are given in gray, and here you can see the major lineages of arthropods. Here we have the insects, here we have the myriapods, uh, here we have the arachnids, uh, scorpions and spiders, and here we have the horseshoe crabs. So we would say these two lineages divert, the estimate is 443 million years ago, all right? So we have a time tree, a time calibrated phylogeny. Now what we can do once we have the time calibrated phylogeny is we can measure morphological characters and we could ask what is the rate that the morphology is evolving? And we could do the same with the genomic characters, the DNA sequences we're using to infer the phylogeny. So what we see here is what I'm showing you here is on the y-axis, we're looking at the absolute rate, in this case, of molecular evolution. And here on this y-axis, it's the relative rate of change that is going from one time period to the next. And what we have on the x-axis for both of these plots is the age of the lineage that is estimated using this molecular clock approach. This is the estimate of the actual divergence time between these lineages. So what, we, what this really insightful study showed is that if you look during the Cambrian here, which is highlighted in this box, we see that rates of molecular genomic evolution are at their highest, and they're at their relative highest as well. As we come out of the Cambrian, the rates of molecular evolution essentially uh, uh, maintain this rate, and they're not changing through time. They're at their highest in the Cambrian, and they're changing to a slower rate coming out of the Cambrian. The bottom box is showing you the rates of morphological evolution. So think of evolution of the phenotype. And again, rates of evolution are highest in the Cambrian, and they're slowest as we come out of the Cambrian. So we see this signature of the Cambrian being a really important time in terms of both the phylogenetic diversification of the major living lineages of arthropods, but also a time where genomic innovation was likely at its peak 
as well as a time where phenotypic morphological evolution was at its peak. So what we're seeing in the fossil record with the appearance of all these major lineages of animals is reflected when we study the evolutionary history of living animal groups such as the arthropods. Okay, now we're gonna dig in and think a little bit about the phylogenetic relationships among these major animal groups. Now, traditionally, and certainly the phylogenetic relationships I was taught when I was in your seat in college, is that sponges represent the living sister lineage to all other animals. So here are your sponges, then here are all of your other animals, a group that historically was called the Eumetazoa, all right? So sponges, sister to the Eumetazoa. So if we look at sponges, uh, they're actually really interesting. The, uh, they have a cell called the coanocyte that is uh, essentially has a uh, flagellum and the coanocyte cell that we see in sponges is very similar to the coanoflagellate uh, uh, protist lineage that live, they're single cell, but they live co in colonies that are thought to be the living sister lineage to all animals, okay? So sponges are most closely related to animals, but coanoflagellates are the sister living, living sister lineage to all animals, and it seems an ancestral character shared uh, that a shared ancestral character of coanoflagellates in some animals, at least with sponges, sponges is this very uh, 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 identifiable type of cell called the coanocyte. All right. So sponges uh, feed by filtering water, bringing water into their body, and the flagella beat and move the water through the pore. The middle of the sponge is called the atrium, and water is uh, jets out of the top to the osculum, all right? So they're filter feeding or they're uh, through bringing water in through their body. <clears throat> now, the earliest diverging lineages in the uh, historical phylogeny were the tenophores, the comb jellies, and the placozoans. And placozoans are a pretty weird group of animals. They were discovered fairly recently in the history of discovery of the major living lineages of animals, often referred to as phyla or an individual being a phylum. And placozoans are weird in that they have no mouth, no gut, and no nervous system. And uh, tenophores, uh, basically uh, the comb jellies, they have these sticky cells that cover their tentacles that uh, prey adhere to these sticky cells and the prey are then brought into the mouth. So tenophores have a mouth, they have a gut, and they ha and indeed have a nervous system. Okay, now the phylogeny of animals was dramatically upended about uh, 10 to 15 years ago by uh, Professor Casey Dunn, who, were, who is on faculty here at Yale in the EEB department. So essentially, the traditional phylogeny, remember, had sponges as the sister lineage to all other animals. However, Professor Dunn's work looking at genomic scale phylogenetic data sets consistently resolves tenophores as the sister lineage to all other animals. So sponges are, in a sense, more derived, phylogenetically derived, relative to the node that relates the common ancestor of tenophores as sister to all other animals. Well, what's the big deal here? Why does it really matter what is the sister lineage to all other animals? Well, by understanding the phylogeny, I think we've been seeing this in the course so far, we get insight into how evolution has worked in, uh, in lineages. So the alternative phylogenies have very interesting implications in that either tenophores independently evolved a nervous system or uh, a nervous system was lost in sponges, okay? 
So if we think about the evolution of nervous systems in animals, the traditional phylogeny argues there's one origin and one loss, the loss being to the placozoans. But the new emergent uh, genomic-based phylogeny that has tenophores as sister to all other animals argues that nervous systems have either had uh, uh, multiple origins and a multiple loss, or and at least a single loss in the placozoans, or has had multiple a single origin and multiple losses. Those multiple losses being in sponges and in placozoans. So this is why understanding the phylogeny of the major animal groups matters. Okay, so let's start moving up the uh, phylogeny uh, of animals. So we have, uh, there's conflicting phylogenies between the traditional phylogeny and the genomic phylogeny with regard to relationships of sponges, tenophores, and placozoans. Now we're gonna get in the part of the phylogeny where the genomic or molecular-based phylogenies are generally much, uh, have, have uh, been around a little bit longer and therefore in a sense are, are more quote-unquote accepted. All right, so we'll move up to the Cnidarians, which of course include uh, corals. And uh, Cnidarians, now we're getting into where, uh, with animals, where uh, the ploidy with regard to the life cycle is much more straightforward. So we, we talked about the variation with regard to ploidy and life cycle in plants and in fungi. And this is the only time we're gonna mention it in animals because basically very short period of time of the life cycle is haploid, that is the sex cells, just like in mammals. So the organism spends much of its time uh, in the diploid stage. And so cnidarians not only include uh, corals, they have sessile polyps, as well as uh, the modal uh, medusas. Okay, now as we start moving up the phylogeny, we get a clade that now has all the, the, the animals we talked about so far have two cell layers. Now we're getting into a clade called the triploblasts, meaning that they have three cell layers, but they're also called the bilaterians and that they have a bilateral symmetry along the anterior posterior axis. They have three cell layers and they have a centralized nervous system. So all of the other animals we're gonna be talking about form a monophyletic group and they're called the bilaterians or triploblastic animals, okay? All right, now bi bilateral symmetry evolved from radial symmetry. So radial symmetry is the idea that any plane along the central axis divides the animal into similar halves. Whereas in bilateral symmetry, a single plane through the anterior posterior axis divides uh, the animal in two mirror-like images. Now within uh, the triploblast or the bilateria, the two major groups are called protostomes and deuterostomes. So this is within the triploblast or within the bilaterians. Now in gastrulation, that is where the embryotic ball of cells, when you have the folding and invagination and the formation of the blastopore, in protostomes, the blastopore develops into the mouth, protostoma meaning first mouth. The blastopore develops into the anus in deuterostoma, which means deutero second mouth. So mouth second versus mouth first. Protostomes and deuterostomes. Now, one thing that is important to point out, within bilaterians, within triploblasts, there have been at least three independent origins of segmented body plans. Within the annelid worms that we're going to talk about shortly, the arthropods that we're gonna talk about uh, in this lecture as well, and then the chordates, which include us, that we'll talk about in the next lecture. And this will be important when we talk about the evolution of development and thinking about uh, uh, segmented body plans and how that's controlled developmentally. It's important to know that segmentation has at least three origins, three independent evolutionary origins within the bilaterians.
Okay, so let's look at the protostomes. Here in the phylogy, we have the bilaterians, we have the protostomes, and then the deuterostomes. Now, now we've kind of blown up the protostome phylogeny. When I was in college, protostome phylogenetics, the phylogy of protostomes was really complicated and nobody really knew what the relationships were. In fact, people argued that annelids, segmented worms and arthropods were closely related because they shared this trait of segmentation. However, very early day molecular analyses, we're talking late 1980s, early 1990s, resolved two major clades within protostomes that were wholly unanticipated. The first of these were, are, is called the Lophotrochozoa. Now, all Lophotrochozoans have this ciliate trochophore larval form. The ciliate troco, uh, trochophore larval form has been known for hundreds of years, but it was thought that it was an ancestral character of animals or it was something that was convergently evolved. Much to the surprise of people performing these early day molecular phylogenetic analyses, when they resolved this clade that shared the trochophore larval form, what they ended up discovering is that the trochophore larval form was really an important clue into the phylogenetic relationships of all of these lineages, which include really disparate groups such as bryozoans, all of your flatworms, your platyhelminthians, so uh, many of which are parasites, uh, trematodes and cestodes, for example, tapeworms, flukes, as well as many free living flatworms like a planaria, which you may have used in high school biology for regeneration experiments, your rotifers, which are very common in freshwater uh, uh, habitats, brachiopods, which look like mollusks, but they're not annelids, your segmented worms, and also the mollusks, which are a really important group of animals. So all of these lineages form a clade called the Lophotrochozoa. They resolve as a monophyletic group in molecular phylogenies, but also they share this really interesting larval character of the trochophore larvae. And as I said, people used to think that the segmentation uh, that is present in annelids and arthropods meant that they were closely related, but they're not. So here is an example of some uh, annelids, uh, segmented worms, uh, many in marine habitats, these deep sea thermal vent tube worms are annelids, leeches are annelids, as well as uh, the common earthworm. And here's actually Earthworms are hermaphroditic. They have both uh, male and female reproductive uh, structures. And what they do is these two uh, worms, which are connected in a mucous coat, are actually exchanging gametes from the male to female part, uh, the male part on one worm to the female part on the other worm, and vice versa on uh, this, this part of the, uh, the connected or copulating worms. Mollusks are also Lophotrochozoans. Uh, there's been a really remarkable radiation of shelled mollusks, including the early diverging mollusks of the limpets, which have a shell covering the top part of the body. The, the coiled shell of the uh, snails or gastropods, and then the bivalves, your clams and mussels that have two shells. Then of course, uh, there are mollusks that have lost their shells entirely such as your squid and octopi. Now, the other major clade of protostomes, in a way that's very similar to the, oh, I never thought of that discovery of the Lophotrochozoa, is the ecdysozoa. So again, in these early day molecular phylogenetic analyses, a clade emerged that included all of these disparate lineages that nobody really proposed were closely related. But it turns out the trait that they share is the fact that they have a cuticle exoskeleton and they actually molt that exoskeleton. So all of the ecdysozoa share a trait of having an, an exoskeleton cuticle that is shed. Pe again, people thought, 
there's no way that this is a phylogenetically important trait. This is clearly something that's evolved multiple times in the evolutionary history of animals. But indeed, what we see is that having a cuticle and shedding that cuticle is consistent with a monophyletic group resolved in these molecular phylogenies. And this includes really interesting groups, important groups, as such as nematodes, probably the most abundant animal on the planet, group of animals on the planet, as well as the arthropods, which have been incredibly important for marine and terrestrial ecosystems. And we're going to talk a little bit about arthropod evolution, uh, particularly uh, insect evolution. Okay, arthropods have this hard skeleton made of chitin, which is a complex uh, carbohydrate, and it protects the, the, the muscles uh, and the internal organs. And the muscles uh, are attached to from the inside on the, uh, of the inside of this exoskeleton. So think of a vertebrate animal such as ourselves. Our muscles are attached to an internal skeleton, right? Where obviously uh, with the arthropods, what we see is that the muscles are attached on the inside to the exoskeleton. Now we're gonna focus on three major clades of arthropods. So what we're gonna, so here are the arthropods. We're gonna look at the chalicerates, which are your spiders and scorpions, the crustacea, which are your crabs, lobsters, um, uh, ostracods and copepods. And then we're gonna spend a little bit of time thinking about the insects. And in particular, thinking about the insects. So again, we're, here's a phylogeny that's drawn to reflect the estimated time of divergence among these lineages. And what we see is that at a time during the Ordovician, the Silurian, dating about 575 to about 515 million years ago, we have several uh, independent colonizations of terrestrial habitats by these different arthropod lineages. Within insects, we're seeing the origin of flight during the Devonian. Uh, about 350, uh, 360 million years ago or so. And then uh, later, or, or more recently, about 300 million years ago, we have the evolution of what is called complete metamorphosis in insects. And we'll talk about the hemimetabolous versus holometabolous insects. So what we're going to focus on in a way that we did with plants is what were the important features re with regard to uh, terrestrialization, that is colonization of terrestrial habitats by what was initially uh, uh, an aquatic, and in this case, marine lineage. We're going to look at the origin of flight in insects, and then we're going to look at the, the divergent diversification of life cycle in insects and how that, again, facilitated their adaptation to terrestrial habitats. All right. So what becomes interesting is that when we talked about plant uh, terrestrialization is now that we're going to look at arthropods and eventually we're gonna look at vertebrates, we'll look at vertebrates in the next lecture, is that everything that is green plants, arthropods and vertebrates all seem to colonize terrestrial habitats in the same general time frame. That is a period of about 400 million years ago, okay? So, what we see is the colonization of land is corresponding with the rise of oxygen in the atmosphere, as well as the development of an ozone layer in the atmosphere, which is reducing harmful UV radiation. So we, what uh, the planet needed was an increase of or atmospheric oxygen and the presence of an ozone layer. Okay, arthropods are your crustaceans, crabs, shrimps, lobsters. So here we have a crab. Many of you may have seen uh, these terrestrial uh, uh, pill bugs in uh, your backyard or your college courtyard even. Uh, copepods, which are copepods and ostracods, make up a big part of what's called zooplankton in marine and freshwater habitats. And then, uh, of course, barnacles. Uh, which are sessil as adults. Remember, barnacles were the group that Charles Darwin really dove in and gave him some really important insight on homology and 
being important in terms of as evidence for evolution. And then a really interesting ancient lineage of arthropods, uh, uh, exemplified here by triops. In fact, triops is, uh, you could buy the eggs online and have pet triops. Um, and I think even uh, in the residential colleges, nobody would argue if you had some pet triops in your room. The chalicerates are your spiders uh, and uh, uh, mites and uh, scorpions. And in fact, the reading for next week, the Moran and Jarvik paper will be looking at lateral gene transfer uh, involving mites. And then we get to the insects. The insects are uh, arthropods that are terrestrial. They're called hexapods in that they have three pairs of uh, legs. So they have a total of six legs. And uh, there have been three major events in the evolution of insects that are estimated to be well over a million species. So the first of which was the terrestrialization, colonization of land, habit, terrestrial habitats, which happened at a time that was not that long after plants began colonizing land. The living sister lineage to all other insects are called silverfish. These are insects. They have uh, six legs, three pairs of legs, but they're wingless. Then you have the evolution of wings, which allows flight. And we'll talk a little bit about uh, some hypotheses about the evolution of wings and maybe even other functions for wings uh, aside from flight, important in their evolution. Then about 300 million years ago, we see the evolution of complete metamorphosis. So these are some of the major insect lineages and their phylogenetic relationships. So uh, insects such as dragonflies, uh, if damselflies, if they look in a sense uh, ancestral or ancient to you, you're not far off. They are an early diverging lineage of living insects. These are the hemimetabolous insects, which you could see as a paraphyletic group. Then there's a clade, a monophyletic group of insects that are called the holometabolists, that they have a complete metamorphosis. And we'll talk about that relative to hemimetabolous insects, which hemimetabolous is the ancestral state for insects. And the fact we have silverfish around with us and knowing their phylogenetic relationships allows us to argue, to infer that being wingless is the ancestral state for insects. So being hemimetabolous and wingless is, are the ancestral states for insects. Okay, well, insects have to deal with uh, respiration in terrestrial habitats. How are they doing that? Well, essentially all the aquatic uh, uh, arthropods breathe with gills. So insects have evolved a tracheal system. Essentially, it's a series of interconnected trachea or tubes that allow for the passive diffusion of oxygen and passive uh, gas exchange between oxygen and what they have is an open circulatory system. So they don't really have a closed circulatory system. They have uh, muscular hearts that are pumping. The hemolymph is the, the term for insect blood. And the hemolymph is basically just bathing the organs uh, inside of uh, the body of the insect. And these tracheal systems are interdigitating and through passive diffusion along the uh, surface of the trachea is how gas exchange is occurring in these insects. So uh, this is one thing that really limits the body size of insects. If you think about the surface to volume ratio in that as they're getting bigger, there's a much greater volume and the efficiency of just relying on the, the uh, diffusion uh, becomes really low. And in fact, when we see insects at their largest is at time periods in Earth's history where atmospheric oxygen was at its highest. So indeed, here's a, a reconstruction of a carboniferous landscape. We have this huge dragonfly called Megura, uh, Meganura. And this was the only time uh, in the history of life or, or in the history of insects where we have these really large uh, terrestrial insect or terrestrial arthropods, in this case insects, 
because atmospheric oxygen was at its highest. So uh, here is a really large uh, myriapod that uh, imagine running into this thing in the forest floor. And so this uh, mega neura essentially had a wingspan that is about 30 inches. So think of um, uh, a yard minus six inches. And that's a big insect, that's a big bug. And indeed, if we look at atmospheric oxygen versus time, we see at the peak of atmospheric oxygen indeed is when we uh, see these um, giant insects and giant arthropods. Okay, so the insect egg, uh, very similar to the seed, uh, is protecting against desiccation and providing nutrient for the developing embryo. And what we see is that the early diverging living lineages of insects, such as the springtail uh, and uh, silverfish are wingless, and we see that all other insects are winged. Uh, many insects fold the wings across the back. Uh, here, the dragonfly, the wings are um, uh, stick out the side of the body. Now, it's clear that wings contributed to insect diversification in that uh, if we look in the fossil record, so going back uh, through time, so here's the Carboniferous about 300 million years ago. Here we are the Devonian midpoint about 400 million years ago. All we find are uh, wingless insects. Then there's a gap in the fossil record where there are not many insects. That's hexapoda is the name for insects. So there's a gap, but then when insects start appearing in the fossil record again about the Carboniferous, we start finding insects with wings. So what we're looking at here is if we look at the different major lineages of insects, Going back to the Paleozoic and the fossil records, so these are the different lineages, the Mesozoic and the Cenozoic, so Paleozoic being older. These spindle diagrams are showing the diversity of these lineages in the fossil record. So what we can see is we essentially have many of these wingless lineages present in dying off in the fossil record, winged lineages appear in the fossil record, then become abundant in the fossil record. And then we have all of these lineages that are living lineages that are winged. So we're going through these different insect lineages, including some of our very species rich lineages, such as the beetles. See, they have an origin in the later part of the Paleozoic. They become abundant in the fossil record. And indeed in the present day, they're very species rich. Then we have the flies here, uh, the flies, mosquitoes, diptera, become abundant in the fossil record and are species rich. The lepidoptera are your moths and butterflies. And then the hymenoptera, very, very important group of insects, your ants, wasps, and bees, become abundant in the fossil record and indeed are species rich in the present day. Now, it's thought that early wings might have had a possible function uh, other than flight, that is for thermal regulation, that is to uh, either warm up or cool off. And also it's speculated that early flight may have been gliding prior to uh, the evolution of powered flight in insects. So there's three main or theories about the origins of insect flights uh, that uh, the wings essentially developed from either extensions of the thoracic legs, so legs that are attached to the thorax. So insects have three body segments, a head, a thorax, and an abdomen. Or that they were modifications of movable abdominal gills that are found in aquatic larvae of some living, lineage, uh, living insect lineages. Or that they were, here is more the thermoregulation argument, they were protrusions from the thorax that were used as radiators either to warm up or cool off. All right, now we're going to look at the evolution of complete metamorphosis, and in particular, this idea of holometabolis versus hemimetabolis. So holometabolis insects undergo a complete metamorphosis, and this lineage includes the most species-rich clades of insects. So what I mean by a complete metamorphosis is that you have a larval stage, a distinct larval stage, a distinct pupil stage, and a distinct adult stage. All of these groups of insects have this complete metamorphosis. 
But what's the alternative? The alternative is what we see in all of the hemimetabolous insects. They have an incomplete metamorphosis. So has anyone ever seen a, a, um, a newly hatched cricket or grasshopper? They essentially, the, they're called a the nymph because they look like they're a miniature adult, right? So they come out as a miniature adult and basically they're going to grow that body to eventually become the adult grasshopper in this case. Whereas with homo, holometabolus, you're having four different, in the case of this butterfly, you're having four different stages. You're having the egg, the larvae, the pupa, and the adult. And we see with, this is, can be even diversified further. For example, if we look at uh, dipterans, in this case, these drosophila, there are different larval stages, different distinct larval stages, a pupil stage, and then the adult. So the idea is that uh, these different life stages allow essentially the different stages to exploit different sets of resources. So in the case of the hemimetabolus with the incomplete metamorphosis, these nymphs essentially are competing with the same resources as the adults. By having uh, the different uh, uh, life stages, different metamorphic stages. You are uh, utilizing different resources, reducing competition. You could specialize on feeding on very specific resources, in particular butterflies and moth larvae uh, are very specific to particular plant hosts, quote unquote hosts that they're feeding off of. And also it allows for different modes of dispersal and reproduction. Okay, so what we'll be covering uh, in the next lecture is the rest of the animal phylogeny, the deuterostomes. So uh, what we covered today was thinking about uh, animals within eukaryotes and the fact that animals are the most species-rich clade of eukaryotes. Think about the origin of animals, the major line living lineages of animals, and the importance of the Burgess shale fauna, and the different ideas associated to explain the early evolution of animals. Think about the, the, what I mean, the root of the animal tree, what I mean is what living lineage is sister to all other animals. And the early traditional hypotheses had sponges as sister to all other animals. The newly emerging phylogenomic analyses argue that uh, the tenophores are the sister living lineage to all other animals. You should think broadly about the phylogeny of the major living lineages of animals, in particular the bilaterian animals. And within protostomes, we haven't talked about deuterostomes yet, we, we examined the ecdysozoa, arthropods and insects, uh, and uh, we talked about the lophotrochozoa with regard to the groups that comprise that. And with arthropods and insects, we looked at particularly adaptations to land and the origin of wings and flight. So uh, Bio 104 students, until next time, be safe and be well.